Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's event. Welcome to Designing Exogames for Patients with Osteoporosis with Olia Trilly and Priscilla Adekoya, for those who don't know me. I'm a member of the Games Institute, and I'm a registered nurse as well as a PhD student uh, in the School of Tropical Sciences at the University of Waterloo. My supervisor is Dr. Lilidu. My research focuses on the use of technology to mitigate the risk of going missing among people living with dementia. So welcome. And I would like to take a moment to talk about the Games Institute and give context to the land that we work in. I think that's really important, right? <laughs> so for those who are not familiar, the Games Institute, or the GI, as we call it, is a research institute at the University of Waterloo that is home to interdisciplinary researchers who seek to advance the study, design, and purpose of interactive and immersive technologies and experiences. Our research, of course, includes games like the one that we're going to discuss today, but it also includes interactive and immersive media at large. We endeavor to be a place where researchers from all backgrounds can come and work together and learn from each other beyond the boundaries of discipline. And so to our territorial acknowledgements, it's important for us at the Gaines Institute to recognize the enduring presence and deep tradition knowledge, laws and philosophies of the indigenous peoples with whom we share the land that we live and work in today. We are working to continually make space for indigenous scholars, designers, commentators, and creators to uplift all voices that are marginalized in both the academic and gaming communities. We acknowledge that the land on which we work and live today is the traditional land of the Atawandran, Anishinaabe, and Odonishoni peoples. The University of Waterloo, where we work, is situated on the Haldimand track, which includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. We have a responsibility as such beneficiaries to acknowledge and understand both the history and the current experiences of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And for this understanding to inform the work that we do so that we can stop perpetuating the damages of colonization and to begin to repair them. Land acknowledgements like this are just one of very small first steps in doing this work. If you want to learn more about the GHI or our commitment to anti-racism, decolonization, equity, diversity and inclusion, please check out these pages, the GHI, I mean the GHI website, which you will see the link uh, in the chat. And so, so our guest speaker today, <laughs> Leah Twiller is a PhD student at the University of Galway in Ireland. She's currently visiting the University of Waterloo. She has a background of software and computer science engineering in France. She is also part of the Canadian Age Well Network as a highly qualified professional in the making, right? <laughs> Our research focuses on the use of technology for older adults. So before I hand over to um, Olivia, which way is I to hear your guest uh, lecture? Here are some housekeeping uh, items to keep in mind. So today's events will be recorded. Be kind, patient, and considerate. Video communication can be challenging because we have fewer uh, body language cues, connectivity issues, you know, and the list goes on and on. And although we hope to, meet, to mitigate them, technical difficulties can happen. So we ask you to be patient and kind and consider it. For those of you joining us in person, please turn off or mute your devices. During the Q&A session, please raise your hand and I will make sure that your question is added to the queue. But for those of us joining us virtually, you're free to keep your cameras on. In fact, we would love to see your beautiful faces. Unless you're speaking, please keep your microphones muted to avoid background noise. 
During the Q&A session, raise your virtual hand or type your questions in the chat. If you feel more comfortable, the chat will be monitored for questions as we go along. If you require captions, instructions will be posted in the chats. And yeah, I think it's time to listen to the wonderful lecture that we have today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so sorry, I'm just going to be standing with the dress fine to a bit more comfortable. So hi everyone, I'm Elia uh, and I'm a visiting student here at CSAIL and I'm, I'm not going to talk about the work that I'm doing here. I'm going to present more the work that I'm doing at the University of Broadway in Ireland. So I'm going to talk for a while about designing the game for patients with osteoporosis. So just, she said it already, but I didn't know she was going to say it. So just really, really shortly about me, I have a background of engineering and computer science uh, in France in Nantes. And I'm currently doing a PhD, uh, kind of in computer science as well, uh, in Ireland at the University of Galway. Uh, so yeah, really shortly, you can already say before. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview uh, on osteoporosis and the impact that it can have on patients diagnosed with it. So I don't know if you know about osteoporosis, so it's going to be really, really simple maybe. I'm, I'm just going to give you some small things to understand it. So inside your bones, you have this honeycomb structure, and that's the one you can see on the first circle, basically. And this structure is helping your bone to have its strength. So basically, it's giving it the strength to uh, not break directly, but also still resisting shock. So it's really having this structure made for shocks. And when you have osteoporosis, your structure is getting bigger and bigger in a way. The holes are getting bigger, so you have more hair than actually the structure inside. So then you are a higher risk of an osteoporotic fracture or a creative fracture, as you can also say sometimes. Uh, the main cause can be inactivity, diet, and really often age. When you don't have much physical activity, it contributes to reduce your bone density, uh, as well as the inadequate calcium and vitamin D intake, because all of this can impact your bone health. But mostly when you're getting older, the bone mass decreases because that's kind of a natural uh, part of the aging process. The impact of daily life, there is a few of them, but the maybe most famous one is a fracture of vulnerability. If you see osteoporosis in movies sometimes, the main thing that comes is like if the person break, uh, if the person falls, she will break in multiple parts. So basically, osteoporosis increases the risk of bone fracture uh, from really minor falls, so it could be just really tiny fall or major impacts. You also have some postural change. Patient can experience a lot of height and a stoop posture. And obviously, all these changes are also increasing some pain and discomfort, is creating some chronic pain. And it can affect the daily life of the patient really significantly. Significantly, sorry, I can't talk. And obviously, all of these things all together, it can have an impact on independence. It's reducing mobility, quality of life. And it could also create some fear of falling because you know that you're more friend than your health. Preventive uh, fracture, we was proposed or not, it's basically about medication and keeping a healthy lifestyle. And what can be done can be exercise, nutrition, or keeping a really healthy lifestyle. Meaning you can do some weight bearing and muscle strengthening activities to help maintain your bone density. You can try to keep a balanced diet, uh, rich in calcium, vitamin D, and all the essential nutrients. But one that is really important as well is to avoid smoking and to try as much as possible to reduce uh, alcohol consumption because this is not really good for bone health. But the one I'm going to continue on is the exercise part because that's the one I'm interested in and that I can have some impact on. So the physical exercise activities, we have a few of them, I'm not going to read all of them on the picture, but basically you have different kind of activities, you have the way big activities, really simple activities like walking, jogging, dancing, things you can do on your own time and it maintains bone density and strength so it has a good benefit for the body. 
you can do some strength training, uh, like resistance training. Those exercises can help to strengthen muscles and bones and reduce risk of fracture. And it's more important to actually use lighter weights for people with osteoporosis to avoid strain and bone joints. And the last one that is actually really good for patients with osteoporosis is balance exercise because it helps to reduce the risk of fall. Because if you have a better balance, then you can maintain your body better and then you can also reduce the risk of fracture. So to summarize the physical exercise have a few benefits and bones, improve balance, and enhance flexibility. But, but there is a but, obviously, because if people just like they're just with their size and everyone do it, then it would be too easy. The problem is most of the people don't continue the physical exercise because they lack time, they don't have the motivation, it's a bit boring sometimes, it has the reputation of to be a bit expensive, so you don't really want to go. And also when you're already at risk of fracture, you can have some fear of falling, so you don't really want to go to the gym. So, well, I can actually walk on because, again, I'm a computer scientist. I am not from the medical side. It's more on uh, using technology maybe to help these people to go to the gym. And I, I, I can really say it like that because I don't ask them to go to the gym. So I'm going to talk a bit about virtual rehabilitation. So first. What is virtual rehabilitation? Maybe you already know here, maybe you don't. So really shortly, this sentence, virtual rehabilitation offer hope and healing to patients undergoing therapy from the comfort of their own home. I don't always agree with that part because you can also do it with your clinician, so it doesn't have to be at home. With the guidance of healthcare professional and integrating advanced technology and empathic care. Okay, that's a long definition. So if I can summarize it in just one sentence, virtual rehabilitation, it's the use of technology for rehabilitation. That's the simplest sentence you can say. So it can be any kind of technology. It can be VO, it could be AO, it could be video games, it could be active video games that I'm going to talk about later. So that's the picture, there is VO, AO, body tracking and video games. And it can also be different kind of Rehabilitation, it could be physical rehabilitation, which is the point I'm going to continue on later, but it could also be cognitive or emotional rehabilitation. You have some studies on fear using VR or using technology. You also have a lot of study on cognitive rehabilitation, like dementia, using technology. So uh, the AO, VR, echo game in healthcare, I already mentioned that on the slide before but you can use different kind of technology, VR, AR, body tracking, video games. VR, you're completely in a virtual environment. Maybe you already know that, but I'm still saying it just in case. AR, mixed reality. So those one, you're not in a virtual environment, not fully. You're in the room around yourself, but you have those virtual items that you can sometimes interact with, sometimes not. Body tracking, it could be from the really, really cheapest webcam, to the really most expensive uh, motion capture camera. It's just detecting the movement of your body and try to do something with it sometimes. And video games, well, I'm not going to explain what is video games, just playing games. Uh, <laughs> but exit games is a part of the video games where actually you require the user to exercise, to participate in the game. If you ever play with Kinect, you already played an exit game. So, this is a slide with a lot of uh, well, don't worry, it's not going to be really long. On some of the existing form on virtual orientation, I did a systematic video. And we like we were looking at different papers, 23 papers, uh, and we tried to organize our results in two parts. We had our results on the training and on the technology because we really wanted to look how the virtual orientation was impacting the training. <clears throat> So on the training, we we found some improvement in physical and emotional characteristics. But we also found that the training has to be really well designed, meaning it has to be user friendly, clean instruction with feedback provided. It's meant to be really tailored to the participant. It to be personalized, activity specific, and meaningful. On the side of the technology, uh, we found that so hand mounted display HMD. So VR headset, AR headset, it's kind of wide on this part, 
a baseball and camera can be better than the specific device if you want to study the global body, which makes sense if you actually think about it. But it's still something that is important to take in account when you're choosing your technology for a study. Hand mounted display and camera improve balance and gaze better than balance board. So balance board could be any kind of device like the Wii Fit Plus balance. Uh, and hand mounted display can be more immersive, obviously, as a sad surprise, but they are also less comfortable really often for the participant. So I'm going to talk a bit more about designing now that I gave you the overview on many things that was my topic. So I'm going to explain more of the te technological aspect on designing exogames. Uh, so the first thing that I think is really, really important to explain is that the uh, interface has to be user friendly. This is not something new, obviously. There's the main part to say that you're designing for one specific population and this population has to be included in the process. So your interface has to be intuitive. It has to be easy to use because you want to provide accessibility for every user of all age and technical proficiency. If I design something that I know I will understand, I'm not sure that the person of 70 years old will understand the same way. And that's why it's really, really important to mention. Uh, if you want to ensure intuitive menus and control for easy interaction, it's also really important to include participants and using maybe icons that can be understood by everyone. So it's clearer than just using text because we're not like I'm speaking English with a French accent. Maybe some of you don't understand me. So that's that's always some barrier that you can have, you know. And the clear instruction is also something really, really important. Uh, you need to have well-defined guidance and instruction to have a really easy experience. You don't want your participant to be frustrated when they're playing your game. And also, that might be a really simple thing, but you're working maybe with older adults. So maybe they will have some issue to read your content. So you need to think about that when you're designing it. So large, high contrast fonts and maybe colors, the color of the background as well. All these kind of things are really important to keep in mind. And I think the best thing to do is have this iterative process when you're actually designing something, including the population, and then designing again and proposing another version of it that they could actually use. Uh, and then if you're creating exit game, so it probably means that you want to work on the movements. So when you're targeting physical movements, sorry, uh, so you will have uh, the important balance enhancements. So as we mentioned earlier, in osteoporosis, balance is really important. So if exogame can incorporate exercises focusing on enhancing balance, then it's really, really important because it will help to reduce the risk of fall. If you're also working on thread building, it's also really uh, good because it will be weight-bearing activity and muscle strengthening movement. Uh, which again, as we presented earlier, is useful for, for bone health. And coordination challenge, uh, because games that involve complex movement can for coordination and motor skills. And when you're falling, sometimes you could need this kind of coordination to avoid the fall. Um, the thing that is also important when you're designing is that you don't want your game to be too difficult, but also you don't want your game to be too simple. If it's too simple, it's boring. If it's too difficult, it's frustrating. So you don't want to do that. So the idea of it is to create some difficulty and adaptability to your games. You have different levels that you can create, but you can also have some flexible setting. You can have extra game offering a personalized difficulty setting to adapt to every participant. participant sorry. Uh, in my case, for example, we have a physiotherapist measuring the movements of our participants before the study so we know what they are able to do before we start the study so we can adapt it to them we can also have progressive challenge so it's basically the definition of level because you will have those easy level at first and the more they play and the more difficult you can get and what's also good is to personalize your game to create some variety. So we already talked about progressive challenge and flexible settings, so already personalization. But if you can adopt them to their need, but also to what they want to see, 
it could be good if you want to have a feminine voice and a masculine voice because they could like to choose which one they would prefer or if you have avatars they can also choose which gender they would like to have on the display then it could be better for them so better to include it and variety of activities if you have one mini game against a variety of games it could be really small games but then it's creating some variety and maybe it can reduce the boredom and the motivational feedback are also really really important feedbacks are really uh, helping to creating some positive reinforcement um, if i if you're doing an activity and i'm telling you you're doing really really good it's kind of motivating you to continue because it's kind of rewarding you for what you're doing and boosting your moral if i not if i'm not doing anything you're just being on your side i'm just staring at you it's not really nice for you uh the performance metric uh is the inclusion of progress feedback so basically telling you at the end of the game you did better than last time it's great you can do better but you can you already did better it's great uh and the one i really like is the real-time progress tracking so i'm working with a body tracking camera so basically, I can tell the participants on real time if they are doing well or not. So I can help them during the game, tell them maybe try to adapt your posture, but maybe your back is not straight enough. And I think this kind of real feedback are really helping them during the game. And the game evaluation. So this one is not something that you really include in your game, but I would say it's more um, a game design thing. As I was saying about the iteration, it's really, really nice to have this kind of game evaluation where your uh, participant can actually try and give a feedback and you can then improve your game design and it will improve the game experience. So I'm going to talk about my work now. Uh, it's going to be the shortest part, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so really, really shortly. Uh, I am working with uh, a lot of people, as you can see. I'm working with a lot of um, health and social care experts, so occupational uh, therapists, physiotherapists, and rheumatologists. And I'm also following some HAC guidelines, so health service executive uh, in Ireland, so basically our hospital service in Ireland. Um, and we, I'm working a lot with the physiotherapists, is like coming with me really often, trying the game, helping the participants. And all of this is setting some clinical insights. We have guidelines, we have a set of physical exercise that is safe and adapted for our population. Uh, we did the systematic research review that I was already talking about. And with that, we set some guidelines and some technology choice. And yeah, there is always some additional collaboration. But with all of that, we came out with a set of five exo games I'm going to talk about later. Um, first, before the exit game, before the design, we had to define a set of physical exercise that was safe. So what's safe? <laughs> Something that is not putting our patient at risk of fracture or even feeling bad. So we really had to think about it and we decided that we didn't want any floor exercise because what if you're playing at home and then you can't stand up anymore? I, we don't want to create this risk. So we have only exercise where you're actually either standing or sitting on a chair. We have a lot of chair-based exercise that are following the health guidelines from Highlands. Uh, it's really safe and easy exercise to practice alone. And most of them are designed and safe for all the others with osteoporosis and with a risk of fracture. So here are the five exercises. So we have sit to stand, arm rise, squats, step up, and opposite arm and leg lift. So most of them are really easy exercise that you can do with a chair. That's our technology choice. So we have a Microsoft HoloLens 2 and a Niger Kinect body tracking camera. Uh, so we use the uh, HoloLens because we wanted uh, um, to use AR because AR is really, really helping us in this situation. Uh, we are really, how can I say? AR is helping us because we can see what's happening over us. And I don't want my patient to practice a game and then trip over a table and hurt themselves. That's the reason I didn't choose VR, even see through. Uh, I really wanted to have this really direct view on what's happening in the real world. Um, 
So that's the prototype of my Ava games. That's paper prototype that we draw. Uh, so from top right to bottom left, uh, you have the step up, the squats, the opposite arm and leg lift, the arm rise, and the sit to stand. So most of them are the first person point of view, but one of them, so the last one, the sit to stand is at the third point of view because I, I wanted something that was a bit different to break. Uh, the cycle because they most of them have the same mechanics so i wanted something slightly different in one of the games uh so here you have small videos uh you can see the different games so on the corner of each video you can see my physiotherapist doing the game in front of the azure connect and so the red one the, it's the skeleton is a really really basic one that i made on uh, unity and it's reproducing the movement and then you have the two avatars actually following it. So there is six of them because the arm rise can be done standing and sitting. So I have a recording of both of them. Video a bit slow but you get the idea. <laughs> so now that we know oh, why we use the uh, Asia Kinect and how we use it, okay, we it's not that difficult to be in front of the camera and do the movement and it's, seeing your movement, recording it, or doing something with it. What's a good movement? Because if you go to a physiotherapist, he will look at you and be like, yeah, you're doing it right, it's fine. Or you need to adapt that or try to do it better. How does the camera know that you're doing it good? Because the camera doesn't have this kind of thing. So we had to talk with a physiotherapist and try to find the definition of what was a good movement for, for him. And for him, it was an adaptive pace and alignment of the body. But that also means that no one can do it the same way. Because if I do an arm rise, so this kind of movement, and my grandmother do it, we probably won't do it the same way. Or if my little brother do it, it won't be the same way as well. So you need to find a way that the uh, settings are flexible enough. So we we look at the different body drawings. So you can see the skeleton on the screen with all the different numbers. So the Kinect is seeing all these points on your body, and we find the right point that we want to measure. So for example, if I do an arm rise, measuring this angle and this angle. But then I look at the participants and I look what they are able to do at the start because if I ask them to do something that they can't do, then it's not right. And I put my, my limits over what they are able to do. And if the maximum they can do is this, and they really, really can't do over that, then that's the maximum that they need to do for the game. And the game we recognize from here, it's good. So yeah, we try to really adapt our definition of a good movement from one participant to another one. Uh, work on the feedback, because I was mentioning it before that feedback and instruction are actually really important. So I was, again, talking a lot with the physiotherapist and looking how he was doing it during a session. And like you have instructions, do it like that. You have direct feedback, really looking at your body and maybe sometimes even helping you to put your back straight. And you also have indirect feedback. Maybe try to use a chair next time. Maybe uh, be careful when you're using the step, this kind of thing. And I took that and I tried to translate it into my games. So in my feedback into the game, I have more than the text, obviously, but I also have the, this textual thing. But I also have score, I'm giving current position, I'm giving the instruction the same than the physiotherapist will give in a session. And I'm also uh, giving real time reaction to the player movement with some movement in the game object. I also have music and sounds to react to what's happening in the game. So I use again the prototype because I think it's easier. <laughs> uh, so you can see on the prototype, so this one is the arm rise. So you have the instruction that is kind of at the level of your eyes. And an example here, when I started it, the instruction was on the top because for me it was making sense. And I showed it to some participants. I also showed it to the physiotherapist and they were like, I have no idea what I need to do. The instruction needs to be in front of my eyes because I don't see it in right now. If I need to just look like that, then it's not clear for me. So it was one iteration that I need to change because it was not working for them. I also have the score on the top. And on the bottom, uh, I have so 
it's not looking like that in the game. But I have an avatar of the participant basically reproducing the game, the movement at the same time as the player. So it's giving an idea of if the game is telling me my back is not straight and I can see on I can see it on the avatar, then it's actually helping me to correct it, giving me a visual cue. And the bird is reacting to what you're doing. So uh, if I should explain the arm rise game, basically the bird is flying when you're doing the arm rise movement and resting when I'm resting. So it's starting to fly only if I'm doing the movement right. And I need to do the resting time because it's, I need it for me, it's safe for me, but also the bird needs to rest. So we did a session during a conference in December when we tried the squat uh, game. So the squat game is a game where we avoid a cloud. Cloud is coming at you. We didn't want something else because we didn't want something that could seem aggressive. So a cloud is okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in Ireland, so we have cloud, it's okay. Uh, so the idea is to avoid the cloud by doing the squat like he's doing. Uh, so the, it's really, really coming on you and we put it at the side so it's really arriving at your eyes. So you have to actually do the squat to avoid it. Uh, yeah, it was a really demo version of it. So we had more explanation on it and also like really explaining what you're doing and how you should do it. And final step is our intervention. So we are working on that intervention with two groups. Uh, intervention and control groups, and we are hoping to have 25 patients in, in, the, in both groups. They're hoping. Um, so the patient has to be with osteoporosis, and we don't want patients that are too frail, but they still need a certain level of frailty, but not too frail. We, want, we don't want to put people at risk, mostly for a kind of study. Uh, our control group is going to do some physical exercise, really normal physical exercise, like the set of five exercises I showed you earlier. And the intervention group is doing the set of exercise game. So the two groups are doing the same movement, but in a different environment. Control group is doing exercise alone, and intervention group is doing alone, but in the game. They're both doing six weeks of training, 30 minutes uh, twice a week, and we're going to do it in June, hopefully. Uh, and our focus is mostly on physical outcomes, but we also look at emotional outcomes, um, engagements, and motivation. So, yeah, I'm not going to go really in detail here. It's just to explain our intervention is in three phases. Phase one is only to check the comfort with the technology. So we have only the intervention group here, and they try it, and we see if we can continue with them. Because if they feel really, really bad about the technology, we're not going to ask them to then do all the session with it. And the phase two is the main session, a uh, main phase, sorry. Uh, we have a first session uh, where they just try to understand what's happening. So with the control group, they are mostly with the physiotherapist and they are ending uh, booklets so they can know how to do the exercise. They do this first session with the physiotherapist. So we are sure that they are doing it the right way at least the first time. And on the intervention group, uh, they have a second look on technology and we also give them a booklet with the games and explaining what's happening. And then from session two to 13, on both groups they are actually doing the intervention. So they are doing what we ask for. So it does a, a therapy, either the game. And then it's final assessment and then phase three is mostly debriefing. So yeah, expected outcome, as I say, is mostly physical outcome, so muscle strength, flexibility, balance, but we also look at performance, pain, uh, confidence, engagement, and if they enjoy more the training in one case or the other. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Uh, this intervention is meant to be done at home by the participants themselves? No. no, it's doing in a clinical environment. Okay. Uh, we are doing it at the hospital because uh, our physiotherapist believes that it could be a really good tool for physiotherapists, actually. Mm, okay. So we don't see it yet as a tool for home but more something that you can do in a clinical environment. Got it, got it. Thank you. Um. Hey, I
think, 45 some chords. Mm. Oh, that's not yet. Okay, yes. <laughs> We're still waiting for our online audience. If you have any questions, please uh, put it in the chat. Yeah, let's go. Um, I don't know the, the practices, you know, in like um, Ireland, in the States, or in France, or somewhere else, but how hard is it for you to like have access to or recruit these like um, professionals that help you design and run your study session? I'm telling you, like, here I work in a project that is sort of similar in physiology and recruiting professionals like certified physiotherapists or clinicians has been a uh, yeah, a uh, little bit of a challenge, but in your case, like... Uh, I was a bit survive. lucky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of my supervisors is a rheumatologist, and he's the one in charge of the Texarkan uh, in Norway, so he's the one actually diagnosing people with osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit helping. Okay. And for the physiotherapist, I just knew someone that knew physiotherapist that was interested at the <laughs> hospital. So yeah, I guess I'm just lucky. I don't know if... Uh, I guess in Ireland we really have this thing of just talking and see if anyone's interested. So I got lucky, but uh, I, yeah. Nice. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and second, I mean, if I may, unless somebody okay. like, what are the roots of this of this project? Like, how do you you know like launch this project or start this project? Like, somebody reached out to you saying that there was a problem, and you know, like. Basically, like offering if you were interested in doing something or something that you like by yourself, like wanted to do. Um, so it's part of a program. I am part of a, a PhD program in Ireland for the real and the other few projects. Also, awesome. and my supervisor in Ireland basically the other project because I have a few yeah. osteoporosis projects, but none of them was including AR or VR, and she was really interested in this aspect, so I joined on that. Yeah. So the project was outlined like, yeah. and used like... It was just a title mm -hmm. and I, I I made it from the title, but the title was a bit... Uh, it was really long. It was AR, VR, post-tracking uh, for osteoporosis, so it couldn't be anything. Yeah. But, yeah. So you just tailor it the way you... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. My question would be, you said you motivated this, uh, your project basically that increase motivation to keep training to keep uh, the retention high uh, so what kind of game mechanics do you use because when i uh, so there are of course already extra games for elderly patients especially in care homes and when i um, the elderly camps that i visited usually even though we have these games have a lot of gamification elements in it uh, still the retention goes down after some time so usually when i see that uh, elderly people use them still it mostly comes from them that they compete against each other with scores so especially old adults seem highly competitive which was a new finding <laughs> by me uh, so, which is not the intended way so they compare among each other which is not part of the game but still um, so what kind of retention mechanisms do you use in your games okay uh, so, in our games, what we are really trying to have is this kind of uh, score and motivation feedbacks. But we also really take into account the fact that it's going to be given uh, not in ho at home, but more at the hospital. So we are in a slightly different context, I would say, because it's different if you go to to shop and buy a game, or if you are at the hospital and your physiotherapist is telling you. I think this could be good for you, and this is slightly, it's the same thing that you would do in, in normal therapy, but you can do it as a game. So I would say we, we try to include engagement, but we also look at the difference between normal therapy and games in that aspect, because it will be given in a clinical environment anyway. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah? Uh, I know you talked about a lot, a lot about how they like, kind of like personalize it to like the the person and like how like the maximum like, yeah. they can restore and all that. I was wondering about like could you customize maybe like the visual aspects of it? Yeah, because like for me like my first thought was like there's like the bird, but I was like maybe someone really likes a dragon, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
you know, like that type of stuff, uh, to like make kind of like more engaging for like the person. Yeah, we thought about that. It's it's something we do. Yeah. Uh, so also for the avatar, if you you can choose the avatar at the start, and you can choose the voice also of the avatar at the start. So if you prefer, because you have a voice at the same time of the uh, instruction, or also uh, if someone is saying good job, you have the voice at the same time saying it. Yeah. So if you you can choose the voice, so it's also personalized. It. But also different colors, or if you prefer some. Um, I, I know that I put a bird, but I have a bird, but I also have a butterfly, so you can change it basically. Yeah. Super cool. Um, this is sort of just building off of Marco's first questions. I was wondering something similar, and I know that in different countries, healthcare is funded in different ways, so this would change, but. I wonder if there's a sort of, have you encountered at all any physiotherapists who are sort of reluctant about the idea of incorporating technology and this idea that like, if extra games get advanced enough, then, you know, it'll take over our jobs sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's some. Uh, I guess you just need to find the right people. Uh, I, I met a few people like that, yeah, because I, I I spend some time at the hospital sometimes, so I talk with a lot of people. So there is some people that are not really open to it, but you also, like the future therapist I'm working with is, and that is almost more in the project than me sometimes. I'm so excited about it, it's amazing. Uh, so yeah, and you would invite people to a meeting, it's like, yeah, I just want to show what you're doing. And I find that amazing. So you have these people that are not really for it, but you have a lot of people that are really excited about it. I guess it's sort of about like, you know, whether it's for the most benefit for the patient or yeah. for your personal gain. <laughs> and basically this is not replacing the physical therapy, it's just, um, an addition. Giving an addition possibility yeah. that I would say is just if you want to do it like that, then it's it maybe it's good for you. So it, it's not replacing them in any way. So I, I guess we're okay on that. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering if you could speak to some of the challenges. I know you, you've mentioned some of that but the challenges of designing the process itself and moving through the phases that you highlighted. If you could kind of speak to some of the challenges and how you were able to overcome or you continue to work to overcome those challenges. So you say, do you mean design or do you mean the intervention? Designing as well as the intervention. Okay, yeah. so the intervention is not really done yet. Uh, so I, I can't really talk about it, unfortunately. Right now we just hope that we have enough participants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, for the challenges about the design, yeah, we had a few of them because uh, first, it's we didn't have a physiotherapist directly. Uh, I didn't find it at the like during the first year and a half of my PhD. So the really first year was difficult because uh, a year. In, in first year, yeah, I, I was alone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a bit difficult then to really find which exercises are good because when you don't know anything about it. You can't really talk about it. So that was one of the main challenges. And I feel like we were losing a lot of time because you can't really do anything without the exercise, but you still want to do something. So it was this kind of circle. And then the other thing is when you're doing the design, actually doing the design, I found it a bit difficult to adapt it to the population and then to come back with something uh, that you're happy with, I would say, <laughs> uh, because you have to make so many changes the way you're walking. Because there were so many times I would walk on something and then show it to someone, and I would be really like, I would try it before, like, yeah, this is walking, I can touch it, I can interact with it, everything's fine. And the person would try it and would not be able to touch the menu, and I'd be like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> we need to start again. <laughs> That's okay. So yeah, it's this kind of challenge more in the design and the fact that as a PhD student, you work really, really often alone. And even if you have a team around you, you really, really are often alone. When you're designing, you're really often alone. So at some point you seem to forget that what you're doing is not for you. So it's a bit difficult sometimes when you have to show it to someone like, yeah, I really can't do that. And you have to start again. You're like, okay, just that's not against me. <laughs> So yeah, this kind of thing. I I don't have anything else. My there's probably other things. Uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you. I was uh, before we go to Tola. 
I was wondering if you offered any form of incentives to participants. Maybe that might be a way of, you know, of insight. I don't know, enticement is not the right word, but yeah. <laughs> maybe that would entice some participants and help them. No, we don't really do that uh, because um, first we don't really have the budget for it. Uh, if we want to have like 50 participants, it's kind of a loss and our budget is really limited. Uh, but also what we are basically explaining is like if they participate in the study, if they are doing the exit games or if they are doing the therapy, it's like they're doing therapy actually. So the benefit for them is a physical benefit. If the exit games are not as good uh, as the, uh, no, can I say, if the exit games are not better than the physical therapy, they are probably still as good because it's exactly the same. They're doing exactly the same thing anyway. So, yeah. Thank you. So, Okay, uh, thank you very much, Julia, for that presentation. So, uh, you talked about um, the video, uh, the body tracking video camera, and um, from what I'm able to understand from all of it is that this is more like an individual game. How do you see this um, playing out when it comes to group therapy sessions? Uh, um, so, this is not for group therapy session. It's, a, it's for uh, alone therapy session. Uh, but it would work as well for group therapy session because uh, first the Kinect can try a different body. Uh, if you have two or three people in front of the camera, I think it's still working. I would not say for more, but I'm not sure. But two or three, I think it's working. Um, and you you would need to have different problems, then, but that might be a bit, that could be possible in hospital actually, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we are really thinking it for uh, alone therapy right now. I can ask you another question. <laughs> so it's really important to think of ethics, yeah. you know, ethical issues when you're designing any form of cake. So I was wondering, how did you take that into consideration when you're when you were designing this process? Uh, so we had to go through the ethics. Uh, it was a long, long, long process <laughs> because it's a medical one. So yeah. because we are working with the hospital, it's a medical one. So it was a really, really detailed process. Um, but basically, the fact that we're working with games was really the little problem in the ethics. It was this huge thing and the game part was really tidy in it because the only thing is you're tracking the body but you can't really do anything about that you. You can measure angles but you won't recognize someone from tracking body joint. So this is not really an ethical problem. Then the other thing is you can't really name body ethics, I guess you all know that. So basically it's anonymized but that's not a problem for the game anyway. So yeah, the the game part was not a really huge problem in the ethics part. I would say the osteoporosis part was probably more problem. I'm sorry, just to follow up on that. In that case where you can um, keep track of information, how do you keep record of each patient when you come for different sessions? Yeah, we have a number. Uh, we will analyze patients and we just keep a number to check with them. And when they log in the game, they just use a number and then it's, it's keeping it, it's not keeping the name in the system. Um, I, I didn't put it on my slide, but basically, or it's appearing on the Excel sheet, it's like you have a number of the patients, the day they came and the time, and then everybody joins and the young girls are measured. That's a unique identity. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kind of, <laughs> no, um, like how long would one of these sessions usually be like do they would you like extend them like throughout the session because I know you said like that kind of like if you if they, if they start a little lower they go higher and higher would those would those sessions also extend or would they just at the same time no it will be all at the same time uh, but the level of the game would increase then so it might be a bit uh, more heavy if I can say it like that uh, so the session is not longer because we also have a schedule limit, yeah. obviously. If you want to have 25 participants to come twice a week, it's already a challenge. Um, 
but yeah, we are limited to 25 minutes by participants. Okay. Amy, I can ask another question. <laughs> so earlier you were talking about rehabilitation, you talked about the physical, the cognitive, and the emotional aspect of rehabilitation. Yeah. But I'm not sure, maybe I missed it in your presentation, the emotional aspect of it. If you were able, how you were able to measure that? Okay, yeah. So we are actually measuring the happiness uh, in the training. So we are actually looking if they are happy with the training, if they actually enjoy doing it, because that's not something you always enjoyed. If you come to the hospital to do squats, maybe you're not really <laughs> happy about it. <laughs> uh, and we are also, so we have the obviously motivational uh, aspect as well. But that's not really emotional. And we are also looking at the fear. Uh, so I I count it in the emotional aspect because it's something that makes you like or not a training. If you're really scared to the training, you're not going to do it. So yeah. Have you considered the use of a scale or a tool to measure yeah, do, yeah. Okay. Which one? Uh, we use just a little scale and we we just ask them to position it themselves. Um and there is another thing that we're doing, but we're doing it only with the intervention group. We are also asking them more about the game, what they liked, what they didn't like, which game they liked and why. So we're actually looking at uh, this emotional aspect more linked to the game and if it was good for them, if it was a good experience. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking it's interesting because, uh, you know, there's been quite a few people at the CI who studied eggs or games. And I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. And a thing that comes up almost constantly is sort of a reluctance about using technology um, with these elderly populations. Uh, and so I'd be interested to hear you talk about that. But then also one of the things I always think is like, well, but we're going to be old. <laughs> like, you know, and like, <laughs> You know, and, and you know, uh, for people who are our age, you know, using VR headsets is just really not that strange or using a touch screen won't won't necessarily be strange. Like, you know, like my mom is 60 now and she's I've got her in a VR headset. She was reluctant, but I got her to do it. So I guess I guess what my question is, is do you think that this sort of field of exer games and VR physiotherapy and so on? Do you see it really expanding as a more technologically literate generation agents or? Yeah, definitely. And also because the technology is improving and becoming more accessible in a way, uh, you're not using a VR headset now. And I'm, I'm not talking about abilities, I mean, but you're, it's easier to get a VR headset today than it was like five years ago already because it's easier for the population to buy them already. So it, it, it's also easier to explain it. I had a few times at the hospital talking to clinicians that I never use a VR headset or AR headset, and they would be super excited about it because they, they just heard about it and they never used it. So they just, just come and try it. Right. And for them, it's just really great. Well, they're like, yeah. I'm living in the future. <laughs> <laughs> But one thing that can be a barrier is that it can be expensive. Yeah, it's, it's more common. But if you think of people with low income, some people probably yeah. need to afford it. And that's true. Uh, and that's one of the problem with that we could have here because we are using the oil and too, and it's quite expensive. Uh, not something that you can buy just like that, I guess. Um, that's also why we focus more on a clinical setting because the hospital will have more uh, funding for that and if they can use it to actually help the physiotherapist it's actually a good thing. You know, I want to say if you have any hands up but now and online. So I guess it would be great to close this and uh, I just want to say thank you so much Olya, for your insightful lecture. And I'm sure we, we all enjoyed it, right? <laughs> and thank you for sharing your research with us. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today in person and both online. And if you have further questions or comments, uh, please email the Games Institute Operations Coordinators if you have any questions for our guest speaker.
And feel free to chat with her once we finish or to contact her directly. I'm sure we, with your permission, we can have your email address posted on the yeah. in the chats. All relevant links will be posted in the chat. And I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.